All right, clubwwi.com members. You guys know one thing about this site, and for a long time, we've been on a mission to find the men from Men on a Mission. We had Mabel, we had Oscar, but this week's guest, well, he is a man on a mission, but if you know what's good for you, you'll just call him Sir. Guys, the one and only Sir Mo himself. Mo, Mo, how are you? I'm going good. How are you, sir? Good. Now, I'm really glad to have you on. And before we even get into your career, why don't you just let everybody know what's going on by you and how are things in the world of Sir Mo nowadays? Hey, uh, things are great. I've uh, been spending a lot of time with my kids the last few years, kind of trying to stay out of the limelight. Uh, right now, I'm currently training for a uh, early spring, early summer uh, MMA debut. Oh, wow. Really? Oh, yes. That is all. I, I, is that something you're into? Is that something you got into in the last few years? Have you always been kind of into that? Uh, it's just uh, something I decided that I wanted to try. Mm -hmm. Just, 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 just another little hobby thing. It's funny because the last few interviews that I've done, I've talked to a lot of people about the fact that it feels like MMA would probably appeal to a lot of people who got into wrestling. Because back when you got into it, wrestling was it, it was a little more honestly realistic, but in the way it was presented, uh, you know, it, it was a little less you know acting and a little more kind of brutality. Exactly, uh, it's just uh, wrestling is all uh, about Hollywood now. Mm -hmm. It's all about actors and models and beautiful people and stuff of that nature. I mean, uh, wrestlers today, uh, it's, it's an old cliche, they come a dime a dozen, yeah. but they all look the same nowadays. You know, oh, absolutely. Back, back in the day, you used to have the, you know, the Koloffs, and you used to have the, uh, the Sheep Herders, and, you know, you used to have all different styles, all different walks of life, all different body types. Now everybody looks the same. Yeah. yeah. It's almost like they all cut from kind of that, that not, not really even a bodybuilder cloth, but just kind of this generic generic wrestler cloth. So they all just look like generic wrestlers, a lot of them. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's just, uh, and it's not people that, it's not, with the exception of the Triple H's who study the game and, you know, really uh, work hard to perfect their craft, Everybody else getting into it nowadays is just a, a, a job. It's just a, you know, it's like, it's like going to Hollywood, you know, want to be actors. Yeah. It's, and it's, I think it's, it's such a weird situation because what you got into, I know a lot of people remember, uh, or may not remember that you and, you and, uh, Mabel and Nelson were, were actually together before you even got to WWF. I mean, back then you would you would kind of figure out who your character was before you got to WWE. Nowadays guys have no character until uh, Vince McMahon gives them one. Exactly, and, and uh, it's uh, it's all done in the boardroom now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's all, you know, you you get cartoonists standing around a chalkboard and they're drawing up these characters and coming up these storylines, and then they're sticking these bodies in these characters. And if you look at it nowadays, uh, it, it doesn't work. You know, uh, you, if you look at what happens, the the characters that they create don't work. It's not until they allow them to be themselves that something generally comes out. Like Stone Cold Steve Austin. Yeah. You know, Steve Austin had to be Steve Williams uh, to, to get over. Then Steve Austin didn't get him over. Yeah, he had to be himself. You know I mean? Yeah, he had to be himself to get over. I mean, so uh, that, that, you know, draw a picture on a wall and create a storyline doesn't necessarily make you a good wrestler. Or make you a superstar. You have to, you have to almost be able to. I, when I brought up about you and Nelson. One of the things that I thought was was great about that time period. You actually, by being out in the Indies, you learn a skill because nowadays a lot of these guys are stuck. They leave WWE. They don't know how to how to be wrestlers outside of that kind of Hollywood environment. But back then, you you learned your craft, and WWE is a place where you went to practice it, as opposed to a place that you go uh, and, and you're kind of told this is how you wrestle. I mean, you knew, you know, you knew how to get over with the crowd on your own before you even showed up there. Oh yeah, that that was the great thing about going to work in Memphis, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. You already learned how to work the crowd. You already knew how to work the people long before you got to that level. So you could go to that level, perform at that level, and then if you left that level, you know there was longevity elsewhere. Now, if you if you really look at what's going on, the guys that come up in the developmental and then the guys that come off of the tough enough. They go to that level, and when they can't perform at that level, look around. Where are they now? Yeah. You know, where are your Chris Nowinski's and 
You know, they're back off doing the, the stuff that they were doing in their general lives. They're not out there on the road, you know, paying dues and stealing business. Those guys have long since gone. Where, I mean, where are they? Yeah, they don't even exist anymore. And they don't. They don't. So uh, the way we came up, you know, I mean, there's, long, there's longevity in the guys that's come up. I mean, yeah. it's, it's a sad state of affairs, but I'll give you a prime example of what I'm talking about. <clears throat> Most of the guys that come up in the business when we came up in the business, you know, the ones that have a past and gone on, you know, for whatever reason, you know, are still out there. Mm -hmm. Still out there working the grind, the Ricky Moores, the Tracy Smothers, you know, the Greg Valentines, the Rick Flares, the Dusty Roses. You know, these are guys that are in their 40s, 50s, 60s, 70 years old, and they're still out there doing it. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, oh yeah. They came up learning how to work and learning the system, and they're still out there doing it. And then you got these guys that come in here, and they get spoon-fed and, and get thrown into it. And two years after they lose their TV jobs, what are they doing? Yeah. They're ODing on drugs and committing suicide and all this stuff because they haven't learned how to handle the pressures that go along with the business. No, yeah, absolutely. You know what? I mean, I was going to say to you, one of the things you brought up, some of the guys that you brought up, and and I've, I've brought this up to people before that amazes me. Guys from that generation that learned how to wrestle, in that they wrestled, they did, they told the story in the match, they did a lot of psychology. You could do that until you're 90, you know, in front of a car. It's the guys who, who flip around the ring that have to retire at 35, and they think they're getting over, and it's like you're really just cutting your career. You know, by two thirds by doing that. Whereas if you just learned how to wrestle and kind of tell a story in the match, you could wrestle forever. And 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 look, look at the bullet Bob Armstrong. Mm -hmm. You know, look at look at handsome Jimmy Valiant. These guys are still sixty, seventy years old that are still able to go out there and do it. Yeah. You know, that, that, that's proof positive. You know, I mean, there's so much negativity going on out there right now about. The early deaths, you know, the guys that are dying young and whatever. I mean, really, look at the guys that are dying young or that have died at the real young ages. These were guys that what? These were guys that come up and pay like tons and tons and tons of dues in this business. You know what I mean? You've had one or two. You know, you've had the, 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 the Kirk Hennings and, you know, and, and, and a couple of those guys that pay dues that died younger than you thought they would, mm -hmm. you know what I mean, and, and, and that's because of different things, but for the most part, the younger guys, you know, have died because of what, and they, they didn't learn the business, they didn't learn the craft, and then when the spotlight turned off of them, you know, their lives went where, went to the toilet, man, exactly, I mean, there's, there's no more spotlight, there's no more spotlight, and when the spotlight turns, and I know, I, I'm, I'm a, I'm a living, walking, breathing example there. When that spotlight goes off, man, mm -hmm. unless you're in the right frame of mind, you, you lose yourself. It's like, okay, what do I do now? You know, yeah. what am I going to do with myself now? You know, so, you know, but because I had come up, you know, paid dues, and I worked prior to getting in the wrestling business, I had something to fall back on. A lot of these guys don't. Exactly. And so when they find themselves out there, you know, they can't wrestle anymore. They are not in that spotlight. And, you know, they get depressed. And when you get depressed, what does it lead to? Alcohol abuse, drug abuse. And after a while, when you do that a lot, you know, over a period of time, the, something's got to give. Exactly. <laughs> Why are you... Something's got to give. I was going to tell you, we, one of the guys who actually hosts an audio show on our site, Paul Roma, uh, works on, on the website. He was just on yesterday. And we are talking about the exact same thing about transitioning. And he said, you know, you get to that point where you have to transition. He's like, and you want to know, you know, why it's because he's now in his new career and out of wrestling. So it took about a year to kind of get away from the whole thing. He said, but when you call me to talk, he's like, I'm alive. He's like, because, you know, you have to kind of humble yourself and say, okay, I'm not a superstar anymore. I'm not going to try to hold on to that. If you're going to be able to have some sort of normal life, because regardless, there's, you know, such a small percentage of guys who can, who could really be in, in a huge spotlight for their entire career. It just doesn't happen. Right. It's, it's few and far between, exactly. and, and you have to recognize early in it 
that, okay, I'm only going to be on a certain level. You know, I'm only going to go so far with this. You know, and if I'm going to go any further than where I'm at right now, I'm going to have to do some drastic stuff. Exactly. You know, I'm going to have to make some drastic changes. Like me, for example, you know, when I left, when I left Vince in 96, you know, it was like, <laughs> you know, I don't ever want to put myself in that environment again. Because mm. to me, it was horrible. It was that with him? It was, it was such a horrible experience. Okay. The entire experience was horrible. Really? Yeah. Oh, bruh. The entire experience was horrible. It, it, it was it was horrible. I, I had more I had more fun working for the Jazz in Memphis, making a hundred and twenty dollars a week. Yeah. You know, living in a cheap, broke down crack hotel. <laughs> you know, going up and down the road. I had more fun. You know, than I did working uh, up in WWF. Was, was it the politics, or was it just the, the corporate kind of structure? It was. It was. It was. It was the politics. It was. It was. Uh, you know, Vince was fine as a boss. Vince was fine, but what I can't understand about Vince McMahon is a guy that is that brilliant. You know, to me, I felt like at that time, you know, he was going through the steroid trials and all that stuff. He allowed certain people in his organization, you know, to mistreat his talent. You know, there's things that went on that I'm not going to say he knew about, but there's things that went on, man, like with us and with myself and with Oscar that, you know, here in the, in the, in the real world, yeah. in the real world, that company would be shut down Yeah, for, for some of the things that we went through. It, you, yeah. know, you hear a lot of stories about that too. It was almost like the Wild West, and here you are. You know, it, they're making so much money that they they're still kind of operating like the Wild Wild West, where there's no rules. But it's like you know, you guys are pulling in more than than the PGA is pulling in. And, and, and the thing about it is, man, there is, you know, I can understand people like Bruno San Martino, Billy Graham, and people like that being upset, you know, about the the health insurance issues. You know, a former talent. Mm-hmm. You know, you get hurt back in the day. You get hurt if you got hurt. You couldn't work. You didn't make no money. Yeah, that was just period. Point blank. If you got hurt, you got hurt. You didn't make no money. If you didn't work, you didn't make no money. There wasn't no guaranteed contract, and there was nobody that was going to say to you, "Okay, Bobby, you broke your leg today. We know you're going to be out of work for eight weeks. Don't worry about it. Go home, heal up." You know, we're going to see your check each week until you're better, and then when you're better and you're healthy, you're going to come back to work. No. That was unheard of. Yeah. At least I know in my case it was unheard of. I broke my leg, you know, March the 1st of 1995. Okay. I had surgery the next day, and less than 11 days later, you know, I'm taking my leg up. Uh, you know, I'm putting athletic tape Man. around a broken ankle with a steel rod and nine screws. God. And I'm going back to work. Man. You know, <laughs> I mean, I can, I can, I can hand deliver some x-rays to you and show you. I went back to work. And it wasn't, you know, it wasn't, you know, being strung out on no pain pills or nothing. It was, you know, clear mind, you know, in pain, just work. And that was the only way I was going to make it. That was the only way I was going to get paid was to work, you know. So, I mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I put it to you like this. I hear them say this all the time. The toughest SOB in professional wrestling today is Stone Cold Steve Austin. I hear them say that so many times and I laugh about it because I think, shit. Well, then if he's a tough son of a bitch, then I'm a tough son, son, son of a bitch. Because <laughs> I had surgery on my leg on March the 1st, and with a steel rod and nine screws, I went back to work less than a week later Man. and had to work through it. Like a tough grandson of a bitch, right? <laughs> I'm telling you. Uh-huh. I, you know, so, I you know, but, but, you know, back in the day, you know, uh, somebody like a Shawn Michaels, you know, his belief was, as long as your ass can walk to the ring, you should show up. Yeah. yeah. And as long as you can walk to the ring, you should show up. And, and so, you know, hell, uh, after sitting out on the sidelines for nine months, you know, it was, it was shut up or show up. Yeah. So, I showed up. 
man. Well, I, mean, I think one of the things, too, I mean, that the people, and this looks so funny when, whenever we interview someone from that time period, because back then it was kind of, a, it was really a happy-go-lucky time period for fans watching on TV. You kind of got this impression, and, and it was such a harsh reality to it. I mean, you guys, I think a lot of people, they think back, and, and we've heard the stories from, you know, Oscar and, and Mabel, too, about kind of like, you know, you guys being there and, and your experience there. Uh, and it, it seems like it was so different than a lot of people said, because you guys, I mean, you guys were, were a fun, fun-loving, happy uh, happy team on TV. How, how did you feel about the characters that you played, Men on a Mission in WWF? You know, what was fun about that, the character was fun. Mm-hmm. You know, we thought it was goofy, you know, the first day, but after we shot the VS all day and looked at them on TV, you know, the character was great, you know, the, the ride was great. What, what, what was horrible about it was not the job, not the company, but just the fact that you couldn't go up there. Okay, I'll give you an example. Okay. I love, I love, uh, Mark, Mark Calloway to death. Mark Callis Calloway, mm-hmm. whatever his last name is, the Undertaker to death. Okay. Real good friend of mine, nothing but the utmost respect for him. Since day one, Undertaker's been there, he's had the machine. You understand? Know no, I know. I mean, yeah, the push behind him, the whole. The machine oh, yeah, the whole company has been behind him, just pushing him to the moon. Yeah, you know, yeah, he had the machine. Middle of the mission, walk in there, we had some vignettes, you know, to to introduce us. Mm-hmm. And then we'd come out of the curtain, and we had Oscar Rapper, and he'd get the crowd up, you know. Mm-hmm. And then me and Nelson would do our thing, you know. We'd go out there. Here's a guy 500 pounds. Here's a guy 300 pounds. Out there, I don't care what nobody says. 800 plus pounds moving the way we move. You know, people really got behind us. Yeah. If you look at our very first, if you ever get an opportunity to go back and look at our very first appearance on Monday Night Raw at the Manhattan Center. Okay. If you ever get a chance, look, look that up. Men on a Mission, Monday Night Raw at the Manhattan Center, very first time. When we got our win, and as a matter of fact, it wasn't even when we got our win. When we made the first double team move, the crowd just, just uh, came unglued. You know, real quick, just I don't, I don't want to cut you off, but it's funny that you brought that up because Oscar, when I interviewed him, he had said when he first came in, he didn't really know you guys, he hadn't really seen what you did, and he said the first time he was at ringside, and he watched the two of you in the ring, he said at that moment, he said it was all out the way. He said all I had was respect for what these guys did. He said you, you guys blew them away. I think a lot of people kind of feel the same way. And, 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 and so, and if you if you look at it, you know, instantly the crowd boom was there. Mm-hmm. If somebody thought enough about men on the mission at the time to put the machine on behind it, after that, it it is it is it. it, it to me, there's no limits to where it could have gone because look at look at what the the, the urbanization of characters you know has has done. Yeah. John Cena coming out doing the rap thing, yeah. you know, <laughs> uh, uh, PG thirteen doing the rap thing. You know what I'm saying? Oh yeah, okay. Yeah. How many how many characters have can you tie into rap? Tie into hip hop soul? Well, I was, well, I was going to tell you one of the one of the things that I brought up to Oscar that I think a lot of fans who didn't live through that time period don't realize. It wasn't your gimmick wasn't easy. I mean, it was to be babyface rappers because at the time. PN News is doing the same thing, and in hindsight, PN News is kind of, I mean, I don't know him personally, but his character is kind of like a joke, whereas you guys, you guys had tag teams how to run. It was a tough thing to get over, and you guys got it over. Of course. You know, and, and we did it, man. We did it, and, and we got so much heat, man. Really? We got so much heat. When I say we got heat, well, people, people don't even realize that men on a mission got fired. Mm-hmm. And when I say fired, I mean fired. We got fired one night at a TV taping because we got so over. Really? <laughs> so wait a minute. There's another story on that because I think a lot of people would be be interested to know which kind of like how. Yeah. Here's what happened. Okay. We were in Gypsy, New York. 
And they were having this combination move where I shoot the guy off, do the drop to the hole, he hit the guy with the neck drop. Okay. At the time that we were doing this combination move, Yoko was there, and this is when Yoko was getting his big push. Alright. Yoko Zuma. The big leg drop was Yoko's big thing, right? Uh huh. Me and Mabel had already been talking about Jeff Jarrett's father, Jerry Jarrett, when we got our job. Guys, go up there, do what you're supposed to do, keep your mouth shut, mind your own business, don't have to do your job, get dressed, go home. Okay. So when we came in there, we came in there, we kept our mouth shut, we went in there, we did our job. When the job was over with, we thanked the guys that we worked. We got showered, got dressed, we got on to the next town. This was our routine. Okay. Okay? So we're there two months doing this thing, staying out of everybody's way. We show up at White Plains, New York, the night after the Poughkeepsie thing. Right after we come out of the ring for the Poughkeepsie thing, Bam Bam Bigelow calls us to the side and says, Hey, guys, that leg drop thing y'all do, y'all don't need to do that anymore. And Mabel's like, what do you mean? I mean, we didn't know. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. Know where it was coming at. Mabel's like, well, what do you mean? He's like, well, that big leg drop thing that you do, Mabel, you know, that's Yoko's deal. All right. You know what I mean? That's Yoko's deal. And so Mabel was just, all Mabel said was, you know, man, that's just a combination move that we do. Mm-hmm. You know, that's just something we do. He didn't mean no disrespect, didn't say anything disrespectful. Okay? Yeah. The next day, the next day we're in Westchester, White Plains, New York. We walk in the building. Vince calls us into his office. You know, we you know, miss you, have a seat. You know, the crowd was crazy when we come out at this time. We, you know, we've been on TV two months. Everything's going great as far as we thought. Vince calls us in and says, you know what? I think it's time for men on the mission to take a hiatus. Well, you know what hiatus means, right? Oh, yeah. See you later, bye, right? Yeah. So it's like, okay, Vince, uh, you know, why are we taking a hiatus? You know what, you know, what's, what's the deal? Well, you know, um, um, after, sh- you know, you know, shuck bucket a little while, he finds says, you know what? I'm just gonna come out and say it. The guys you work with around here are a bunch of pussies. <laughs> This, these are, these are, this is what Vince McMahon said. Yeah. The guys that you work with around here are a bunch of pussies. The bottom line is, you guys come here and you do your job and you leave the building and you go and the guys don't see you, you don't communicate with anybody. And quite frankly, the guys are afraid of you because they don't know you. Okay. They don't know anything about you. Man. You know what I mean? Yeah. So here you are, two big black guys. You know, over 800 pounds, the guys were afraid of you because you ain't talking to nobody. You ain't coming in here smiling in nobody's face. You know, you mind your business, you stand out of trouble, but people don't know you, so they're afraid to work with you. Oh my God. But then if you were to come in and be too too talkative, everyone would complain that you're talking too much. Right. Yeah. <laughs> no, but because we're coming in keeping our mouth shut, mind our own business, now we're not, you know. So, Oscar comes up with this brilliant idea. You know, you know, well, why don't, Vince, why don't we, you know, we got a company meeting before TV. Why don't we sit down and introduce ourselves individually to everybody and, you know, let them know why we're so quiet. You know, that we were instructed by Mr. Jarrett to come in, mind our own business, stay out of people's way, you know. So what happened is we go from coming in there being young guys, not knowing a whole lot, to coming in there having to go hang out at the bar, mm-hmm. having a few drinks with the guys, getting to know them. So, you know, for me, it's like it goes from, you know, coming in there, making a little bit of money, being able to take a little bit of money home, because you're not hanging out, you know, partying with the guys and drinking, to coming in there to keep your job. You're hanging out. Yeah. You're partying. You're staying out at 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning. You know what I mean? No. So you, you, you're basically kind of pushed into that, 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 you know, hang out with them to get to know them to, to, it, it, you know. No, yeah. In other words, you got to form alliances, man. That sucks. I mean, you hear something like that. I think a lot of people, they, a lot of fans kind of glamorize the world of wrestling. But I mean, it sounds terrible. It sounds like, you know what I mean? Like, we hear so often about, oh, that guy's a party, that guy's a party, but it sounds like you kind of have to be a party or otherwise you don't work there. Bruh, man. Bruh. 
But you know what, man? That was that was like the one person, the one person that I admired the most because he didn't have to do that. Was Owen Hart? Yeah. When he when he when he would show up, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. When he would show up, it would be on the way into the hotel, and he'd stop in to say hello, and then he'd be gone. But he didn't have to hang out and party. You know, that wasn't his thing. Only because he was in the family and people just knew him from, from way back when. Right. So yeah. he didn't, he didn't have to do that. Yeah. You know, and then he and I were, he and I were so close. People don't even know how close he and I were, but we were so close. But, yeah, but, but you're almost led into that, man. Yeah. You're almost led into that. I mean, that was just one occasion where we got fired. There was two other occasions. I won't mention that right now because mm-hmm. I, I'm, I'm working on, I'm working on a, on a project. Okay. There's a lot of stuff that I could tell, but I, I'm just telling you, man, that it, it was horrible. Man. It was horrible, man. My experience there was horrible. You know, I respect the fact that Vince McMahon gave me an opportunity, and I don't have anything negative to say about Vince McMahon or anybody in his family. Yeah. But the business in itself and some of the people in the business, you know, in upper management, you know, it, it was it was crap, man. It sucked. I mean, I hear some things, especially, I mean, even talk about, uh, in a business sense, racist sense, things like that, I hear some things that, that make me shudder. I can't believe that somebody would, I've, I've heard people say racist things that they think are compliments. I, I heard a story one time of a promoter telling somebody, you know, uh, you know oh, it's great, you're, you're a black man and you can talk. And he thought it was a nice thing to say to somebody. He's like, how did you right. get a job doing anything? Right. Right, I had I had a promoter tell me that I was fucking expendable. <laughs> oh my god! I wanted to knock the hell out of him. Man, I, I don't mind telling you it was it was Bill Watts. I know, I, you know, I wanted to knock the hell out of him. Man, that's so surprising. I, I wanted to knock the hell out of him. JJ was like, "That you didn't deserve that. Say you should you should say something to Vince McMahon." I said, "No, JJ, that's okay." Yeah. Okay. JJ Dillon told me he said, "Yes, Vince had Bob uh, Bill Watts. He was a." Uh, he was a booker at the time that, that Mabel was doing the King Mabel run. Yeah, yeah. Bill Watts was a booker at the time. And, and they had me doing all of this stuff, you know, being involved in all of his matches and stuff, doing all this stuff. Wouldn't pay me nothing. Wouldn't pay me nothing. And didn't show me no respect. And then that cocksucker had the audacity to tell me that I was expendable. Man. Um, 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 I mean, you guys, on, you guys were on top. See, that's the other thing. You have all the times to say that to you. Here you guys are. You were, he was main eventing the pay-per-views with Diesel. You were in his... I mean, you guys worked together right. as a team. It, it, that was the whole right. point. And, and, well, fuck, dude. If I'm expendable, if, I'm, if I don't mean anything to this, then don't have me out here bumping. Yeah. Don't fucking, you know, if, if, if my role in it is not important, don't do the whole Lex Luger come down the aisle, beat my ass to the back. You know, as if, if, as long as I'm not out there being a part of the finish, there's no way Mabel could win. Yeah. I mean, if you look at the finish at, at the SummerSlam 95, mm-hmm. right? Luger comes out, beats me to the back, right? That totally takes me out of the picture. And Kevin Nash gets the win over Mabel. So what are you saying to the fans that had Mo stayed out there, maybe Mabel had a chance of winning? Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, if I, if I was that damn important to the match, right, you know, I, I, number one, I, I, w- I wouldn't be considered expendable if I was that damn important to the match. You know, if I'm that damn important to the match, pay me. You know, one of those things, it kind of seems like I'm from talking to a lot of people who deal with promoters, sometimes they try to tell you things like that to kind of keep the stars at bay. But, I mean, it doesn't even make any sense. I remember that time period, you guys together, I mean, Mabel didn't, didn't even talk much. It wouldn't even work to, to have him kind of going out there by himself anyway. No. He didn't talk at all, man. He didn't talk at all. That wasn't his character. Nah. His character wasn't to talk. You but, know, and the, and the whole thing about it is I got so much heat from working there, but the whole the whole build up to the Mabel thing was number one, if you didn't have a little buddy or whatever to come in and save, you know, I mean, think about it. You got men on a mission. Mo goes in here, 
He takes all the bumps, gets the shit beat out of him, makes the hot tag. The big man comes in and saves the day. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm working 22 of 28 minutes of a match. Yeah. He comes in for two, three minutes. You know what I mean? He's up, you know, to Andre and Haku. What? Yeah. yeah. But, but who, who's the biggest star there? Andre or Haku? No, I know what you mean. No, no, it's a different thing, but you guys are kind of on equal level. You see what I'm saying? No, yeah, don't work together. I mean, all your initials went into the name. It was, it was, you didn't even have men, men on a mission without, I mean, I think the fact that he never played that character again after you left should, should tell people that you guys were, you know, you needed at least you there with him to, to make men on a mission. Right. So, I mean, but it was, it was a horrible experience, bro. Man, is that why? I, I almost committed suicide. Really? Yeah. I, they had me, they, they, they starved me out over uh, an incident with Shawn Michaels, which I would love to go into that too, but that, of course, is coming out in, in, in this project that I'm working on. Okay. But for nine months, for nine months, just to uh, give you a quick thing, for nine months, they took me off the road, took me on TV, and starved me out. I didn't, I didn't make no money, but I, I, what was funny was I was on the road the whole time. For nine months, I was on the road. But I wasn't allowed to work TV. I wasn't allowed to work any of the house shows. But I was at every single one. Yeah, you had to go there and kind of sit there. That sucks. <laughs> yeah, sit there. It's, it's like warming the bench of a basketball game, and you're the sixth man. And instead of putting the sixth man in when you need somebody to play, they put the seventh or the eighth man in and made you sit there and watch it. Man. Nah. This, this is the kind of stuff that I went through for nine months. And it almost got the best of me because... I almost committed suicide. Man. I got so depressed. Is that is that one of the reasons? I know probably a lot of people have probably asked you through the years. You know, Mabel was there for like a decade after, and there was never a point where, you know, you always, I think a lot of fans kept waiting for you to make at least one or two appearances and show up uh, and maybe do something. Was yeah. that ever approached to you? Was that something you just had no interest in doing? The bottom line was, in January 1996, the story's not been told, so I'm going to tell it right now. Okay. Number one, Everybody's under the impression that I got fired. All right. Never happened. I told you there was three occasions when we got fired, but we were rehired the same night. You understand? It? Okay. When I left there in January '96, there was an incident at Royal Rumble '96. There was an incident that happened in the ring involving Mabel that fed out of the ring into the dressing room. Okay. We, left the, we left the building in San Jose, California that night. Mabel and I got in the vehicle, and instead of driving the TV the next day, we drove to California, to L.A., caught a plane, and went home. Okay. Okay? We got on a plane on our own and went home. We did not go to TV the next day. Nobody told us to, nothing. We got home. We called J.J. the next day, asked J.J. for our release. All right. Okay? J.J. said, if you want your release, I need it in writing. Okay. Okay. That, number one, this was in January. Our contract was expiring in June. We we were given our 90-day notice because she had to give a 90-day notice. January, we called him. We told him we wanted our release. He wanted it in writing. By us giving it to him in writing, we were able to be released at that time, still, you know, not be able to take any outside bookings for 90 days, but any future income that was to come to us besides royalty, we had to forfeit. Okay. You see what I mean? I know you mean. Yeah, you had to sit at home, but you couldn't make money. Right. So, January, we we sent him that letter, we got released. Once I was released from that that contract, man... Mm -hmm. I had, I, other than, other than like when they did like local house shows in the town that I had maybe a school or something in, mm-hmm. I would call Howard Finkel or somebody else and say, hey, you, you got a house show here, would it be okay if I bring a couple of my students to work at a dog match, you know, to advertise the school and they would allow me to do that. Okay. But other than that, I never inquired about going back to work up there. You know, uh, or anything of that nature. Yeah. You know, because man, I, uh, that, working for that company almost cost me my life. Yeah. And I think for a lot of people too, but you know what I think is good about it is, 
is hearing you talk about it, even the fact that you're working with them with the students, it seems like, I mean, it, it was rough when you went through it, but it seems like you kind of realize that, you know what I mean? Like, at the end of the day, it still it had its positive experiences, even with all the negativity that went on with it. Oh, oh, you know what, man? I mean, you know, like I said, Vincent, man, thank you. But thank you, your family, for the opportunity. You know, you did, I mean, you didn't have to give me a job. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I, I know a ton of people that wish they had a job today. I, I had one, so, I, I, you know, when you look at the rest of the books, as far as the tag team champions, no, you know, my name's going to be there somewhere. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, as far as that experience or whatever, I'm great, I'm grateful or whatever. It's just some of the people that I had to work with, man, in the management. Some of the management that I had to work with and deal with on a day-to-day basis drove me almost to commit suicide. Yeah. And I would wish some of the stuff that goes on there on my worst enemy. Yeah. Oscar got tortured. You know, he may not even told you, touched on some of the stuff that happened to him, but he got tortured. And when I say tortured, I'm talking about physically abused. Really? I mean, physically abused. See, that's, I think I think a lot of people would see see that because, you know, you guys, with the exception of me, I mean, Oscar was just like you and then he left and there was never, I mean, Oscar, there wasn't even, his real name wasn't even online. He jumped out of the business altogether and you have to figure, you have to go through a lot to, to kind of just walk away as clean as he did. Right. Man. He got physically abused, man. Oh. I mean, he, they mentally abused him, they physically abused, I mean, uh, physically abused, uh, I, I this is just an example okay. of how bad it was for him. This is just an example, okay? It was his birthday. We were in Florida, down in Orlando, All right. at the resort. And I'm not going to name names, but several of the guys took him down, okay, in the hotel. And they had a piece of wood that had, like, little holes in it, like those panels they used to use back in grade school okay. with the holes in it that the principal used to beat you with. All right. And they beat Oscar with this thing, man. They pulled his pants down. They beat him with this thing, man, until he physically started bleeding oh. from his ass. My God, dude. That's how bad they beat him. That's a, and these are grown men going to work, you know what I mean? It's, right. it's amazing. This is how bad they beat him. They, 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 I mean, there was one time, man, there was one time when he was just walking up the hallway in Michigan, I remember at the building, and he was just walking up the hallway, just happy-go-lucky, mind his own business, and Rick Steiner just walked up to him, and, and I don't remember what Oscar said, but he had on a brand new short outfit, white top, white shorts, and Rick Steiner just reached and grabbed it from the top, and just ripped it off of him, man. Oh, man. And the whole time, Oscar's like, Rick, Rick, what are you doing? What are you doing? And he's just yelling and screaming at Oscar like, fucking prick, asshole, you know, just going off. Yeah. And this guy had done a thing to him, man. Man. Had done nothing to him, you know, but what what do you do? Hey, 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 you got to wrap it. It's, it's such a... It's what do you do? Yeah, weird voice. This is Rick Steiner. Yeah. You know, this is Rich Steiner, Scott Steiner's brother. They're the tag team champions at the time in the program against the uh, head shrinkers. What do you do? Yeah. You go to Vince and say, Vince, Rich Steiner just uh, ripped Oscar's clothes off of him. What is Vince going to do? Nothing? Yeah. You know, it, it's terrible when you work in a company, man, and you get abused like that, and you can't feel like you can go to your boss or a supervisor and say, hey, you know, this kind of abuse is going on. Yeah, but there's a difference between practical. I mean, you hear a lot of the stories, people tell practical jokes and stuff, and the fans go, oh, that's not a big deal. But, I mean, for every practical, funny, ha-ha joke, there's something like this that, oh, you know, yeah. horror stories out there. It's bullshit, man. Yeah. It's bullshit. I, it's, 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 it's ridiculous, man. Wow. I've, I've seen some nasty, gross, you know, people taking crap in people's food, crap in people's bags. You know, just just childish stuff, man. Yeah, like children. You know, just, you know, childish stuff. And then the guys that are on top, man, 
the ones, you, you, you've heard the story. They can do whatever they want at that point, yeah. yeah how many guys have you heard come on that program and talk about how much of an asshole they thought Shawn Michaels was yeah. or yeah. Triple H or whatever? Yeah. You know what I mean? They come up a lot. You know, uh, Triple H was never an asshole to me. Hmm. You know, he, 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 I, I never, I never had a problem with him. But that was before he really started to blow up a little bit. I mean, he was still yeah. kind of fairly new. Of course, Shawn Michaels, I had the greatest, utmost respect for him. And then there was one incident that he and I had that, that, that kind of led me to that suicide thing because of the way he handled the situation. And he didn't even, he, he to this day don't even know, you know, it's just, it's, it's amazing to me. You know, you're a born again Christian. You know, you, you need to make amends to all the people that you hurt on your way up that ladder. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, so we had a phone call, right? I still, I still feel like he owes me an apology. Man. But that's going to come out of the project that I'm working on. I may never get that apology, but people will hear about it. You know, they'll yeah. hear about the situation. You know, so, I mean, but I'm okay. You know, uh, I love wrestling. I still watch it. I still watch Vince's Mitch, program. I watch TNA. Oh, do you? I like, you know, you know, yeah, I keep, I keep up with it. I keep up with it. I keep up with it because my children love it. Well, you actually, you know? by, by, by telling me that, you actually make, is it the last question that I ask everybody, sometimes it's going to be rough when I get somebody who's not watching, but you're actually going to make it a little bit easier for, uh, for you to answer for me to ask it. <clears throat> if you could choose someone, maybe someone that you grew up watching, maybe somebody who's wrestling today in TNA or WWE that you say, you know what, I, I wish Mo could have worked with this person. Who would you pick? Number one? Yeah. Rick Flair. Flair. Oh, oh, yeah, you guys, he was in, uh, I guess, WCW the whole time you were there, right? Yeah. Rick Flair. Man. Yeah. That was something. I mean, uh, if, if you had asked me that, if you had asked me that when I first broke into business, I would have said Shawn Michaels. Mm -hmm. But in 95, Mabel and I worked the program. We, we worked on top for at least a month against Shawn and Kevin Nash. Mm -hmm, I remember that. You know, so so I had an opportunity to work with him. I worked in a few matches with, with Bret Hart, you know. So, but yeah, Rick Flair. Man. I would I would have loved to just be able to say that I was in the ring with him. Wow. You know, to bump, to bump for the nature boy. Well, I'll tell you. Well, he, he's, uh, I think he's going to be around for, for a while more, so <laughs> he might still have some time. He's still out there. I, 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 I've, I subscribe to to you know wrestling insanity. Uh -huh. You know I, I, li I listen to to what some of the other guys have got to say, and I I personally man have have been asked so many times to speak about the business, and there's so much more I could say. I just won't say, man. No, exactly. You know what I mean? I know you know, I'm, I'm not here. I'm not here to beat up. I'm not here to beat up on a business that fed my family for three years. Exactly. You know what I mean? Not the yet. business itself fed my family for three years. You know, I mean, Vince McMahon fed me and my kids for three years. And so I can't, I can't knock him for the three years. But what I can knock is his management. Mm -hmm. The people that he had running his company and some of the guys that worked for him. You know, because they made it, they made it the absolute worst time of my life, man. Yeah, man. You know, and if, if I knew then what I know now, I would own a part of that company. Simply because there were so many unethical things going on in that company, man. From, from, a from a, Racial standpoint, from physical abuse, verbal abuse, you know, it, it was abusive, man, working there. It was abusive. It's one of those things where I think, uh, I think a lot of people, I mean, especially the time period you were there, it was like kind of that, that time period that most people associate with a lot of those, those problems. I mean, it, it's whatever WWE talks today about how things have changed, they always kind of point to the, the 90s and 80s, and it's not like that anymore. So it kind of gives a lot of fans an idea of how bad it must have really been back then. Uh, well, it, it, yeah, it, may not, it, it may not be like that anymore. Mm -hmm. In that, in that, the reason it's not like that anymore, 
I'm going to go out on a limb and say it. The reason it's not like that anymore is because back then it was a privately held company. Yeah. Right now it's a public company, which means that you're under a whole lot more scrutiny now than you were back then. Because back then, you know, anybody couldn't just tell you how to run your business and anybody couldn't just come in and say, you know, talk to me about how you treat your employees. It's different now. Yeah. Now that's an answer to people. Trading company. You know what I mean? It's someone to answer to for a change. Like before, just the buck would stop with him, and now he's got to answer to a board of directors. Right. So the 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 you know the 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 terrain has changed a lot. Yeah. So a lot of the things that that you know go on, you know, don't go on. You know, a lot of the hazing that went on then don't go on. You know, there's still some, but not like it was. Yeah. You know, and, and they still they still punish guys. They're just not as open with it as it was in the past. You can always, you can even today, you can tell. Tell me how you go from winning the pay per view one month on Sunday, becoming the world's heavyweight champion. Mm-hmm. And then by Thursday at the end of the week or by the next pay-per-view, you're not the champion anymore. And then you work in mostly dog matches, getting beat to a mid-card guy. Oh, they, they, they do it all the time. I mean, that's... Uh, you know what I'm saying? Oh, we have Kazarni on. The guy did two vignettes and got and won his first match on TV and got fired. He said, I didn't know what the hell was going on. He said, you know, I... It, it's kind of a different, I mean, there's, there's no rhyme or reason sometimes. Guys get fired on a win, pushes go up and down. You're, you're in the main event one day, and then that's it. Nothing even transitions to another feud anymore. Right. Why? Yeah. Why? 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 It's, like a, it's like a punishment. Because he, he walked in the dressing room, and, and uh, he was so loud and obnoxious that he threw out some pouts and he shot Michael's boot and pissed him off. And so he goes to whoever in the right department says, you know what? I don't think CM Punk needs to get pushed anymore. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And because you're Shawn Michaels, guess what happens? And that's it. That's what happens. Your ass don't get pushed no more. Yeah. That's what happens. You see what I'm saying? No, I know exactly what you're saying. It's kind of that's, that, that's what happens. You know, I, I'd like to see, I'd like to see a rookie walk into a dress room and tell a coach, uh, Brett Favre won't throw me no passes. I don't think he needs a quarterback no more. <laughs> you need to put him on the bench. I know what you mean. What the hell's going to happen? Yeah, it wouldn't work like that in a real sport and right. something like that. Yeah, right. they would just Brett get out of here. Tell the coach, you're not taking me out of the game. Yeah. yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, over here now it's all his buddy, buddy. No, because I mean, that's the way it is, and it's, uh, I think it's a sad thing. But one of the things i got to say to you, uh, as, as somebody, I said before, we've had Oscar on, we've had Mabel on. I think a lot of fans out there, regardless of, uh, you know, of everything else, uh, I have such fond memories of you guys, and I know from the last two times I had everybody on that there are a ton of men on a mission fans out there still. I know you guys are making some appearances, but before I let you go, Mo, I want to give you the opportunity to speak to all of the men on a mission fans out there. So what do you have to say to all your fans? Hey, I'm just going to tell you like this. The truth, the God's honest truth is going to come out. It's called Sermo, the God's honest truth. My life inside a World Wrestling Federation. World Wrestling Entertainment, whatever the name is right now, is coming out real soon. It's going to give you a complete, you know, inside detail account of what happened before, during, and after my career there. It's going to tell you about how homosexuality led to my team winning the uh, World Tag Team titles. It's going to tell you about my utmost respect as well as my disdain for the heartbreak kid, Shawn Michaels. Give you a little bit of insight on uh, an angle that was in the works between myself and Owen Hart shortly before he passed away. Okay. The respect that I have for Brett the Hitman Hart, the Macho Man Randy Savage, and a host of other things. Yeah. You know, Men on a Mission uh, as a tag team at, at the World Wrestling Federation may be dead. They don't mention us very much, and that's fine. But Bobby Horn is alive and well 
and you will see him soon. Just keep your eyes open for Bobby Horn, the God honest truth. Excellent. Bobby, you know what? When you have that project ready to go, we'd love to have you back on. It's been a pleasure, and I want to thank you for taking the time to talk to our listeners today. Thank you, too. God bless you all. Merry Christmas.